Um, people are still logging on, but that's all right. And sure. we're recording this as well. So it's going to be sent out to current students as well as prospective students. So they can enjoy the talk as well. Um, and so I want to welcome Dr. Lauren Toussaint. Thank you everybody for coming. It's our now third IPS Global Lecture Series talk. So we just started this year to give um, people the opportunity to hear people in different areas of research. And um, last talk we had on resiliency and marriage and family. So our general topic in times of grief. Um, in the fall, we had a talk on leadership and virtue. So we're very excited to have Dr. Toussaint with us tonight. And he's gonna speak on forgiveness and human flourishing. So I'm very excited, looking forward to your talk. Um, Dr. Toussaint is professor of psychology at Luther College. And um, he's also vice chair of the Forgiveness Scientific Advisory Council, um, Templeton World Charity Foundation has done a lot of work on for forgiveness. Um, from the psychological side, he's a wonderful researcher, very experienced researcher. Um, he's president of the Forgiveness Foundation International and um, just has, I think, a naturally integrative outlook um, from his Catholic faith, seeing the person um, as holistically and looking at forgiveness from a, I think, integrative and psychological perspective. So, um, very excited to have you um, share with us tonight. We will have a presentation and then the last 20-ish minutes, we will have time for questions and answers. So if you have questions throughout the talk, if you, um, the participants would just put it in the chat or the Q&A and then we will kind of, I, I will read the questions out loud in the end and we'll work through the questions that way. So but right now I'll hand it over to Dr. Toussaint. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Well, thank you for that very kind introduction. It's um, it's my honor, and uh, I have been looking forward to this since I think we first talked about it. Uh, what seems like maybe months ago now. So, um, yeah, thrilled to be here, and should be a lot of fun. I look forward to the questions and uh, discussion. Is always probably the most fun. So I'll say a few things and then kind of get out of the way so people can, uh, you know, get their specific things. Um, asked and answered. So the plan is I chat a little bit about forgiveness and human flourishing, and then we'll open it up to some questions. And I'll, I, I really don't have a lot of formal stuff to discuss. I mean, some ideas, I'll reference a little bit of research, but nothing real uh, too heavy a lifting. And I want to start by saying, so this would be my vision of what it looks like in DC right now. Um, and I'm assuming you're going to tell me that's exactly the view that you get every day when you wake up in the morning. Is that right? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, if you if you could see the weather that I endured today, you'd know why I was looking for a good picture. So I wanted to start off on a light note. And um, I hope that your spring is going well. Your semester is moving along smoothly. Um, we're about halfway into our semester here, just passed through our spring break at Luther College. And so we're kind of into the home stretch. and. Uh, it was a pretty drab and dreary day, but um, the hope that tomorrow could be better is always out there. And um, spring is, uh, you know, kind of eternal rebirth. So um, looking forward to that. And I hope you are, too. Uh, I wanted to talk about forgiveness and human flourishing, but I wanted to talk about it at, at multiple levels. And one of the things I kind of wanted to focus on tonight was, um, you know, kind of the community level, because it's often a part of forgiveness that we don't necessarily think about. And I think, you know, the recent few weeks in our world have once again highlighted that uh, while forgiveness is a big thing that we have to contend with on an individual level, uh, it's also a very big thing at community, societal, national, international, and global levels. And so I'm going to try to, as I go, you know, kind of incorporate a little bit more of the community level uh, applied nature of um, the work that I am either doing or, or kind of hoping and planning to do. So, you know, if we look at our uh, community environments, um, whether it be schools or families or workplaces, um, these are places where there's just a lot of conflict often. And it's really hard to sometimes think about how to get past that. Um, if you're anything like me, 
um, you know, the social justice call of of our faith is has got us in a bit of a bind. You know, we're, I, I think we're trying to do the right thing. I'm just not sure that we always are. And um, it's really hard. The conflict um, is just frankly really weighty. And so some of the examples that I have on the screen seem like minor things compared to the kinds of things that we might be thinking about uh, that most be, might be most salient to us um, in the last few weeks. But nonetheless, um, you know, bullying in schools and workplaces, family uh, conflict, trauma um, abounds in, in our um, societies and has for some time and probably will continue uh, for a long time to come. And so the first place that I usually start with this conversation is to think about the notion of unforgiveness because um, forgiveness is kind of more the answer uh, and and the problem is unforgiveness. So the, the, the root cause of why we're here is that, you know, people hurt us. There's some kind of injustice that is done and that is uh, what precipitates the sense of unforgiveness and unforgiveness is something that's uh, stressful. And so all of the aspects, um, Dr. Clausey mentioned um, that, you know, my, my view is uh, integrative and, and that's, you know, very true for the kinds of things that we think about when we think about the influence of unforgiveness on stress, there's psychological, there's behavioral consequences, you know, it changes the way you think about things. There's certainly psychoendocrine um, things going on in your, um, you know, your kind of hormonal system. Um, there's psychophysiological things going on that are, you know, changing heart rate and respiration and things of that nature. And then, you know, last but not least, of course, is that there are social consequences of stress that we all could probably, um, uh, you know, relate to. So uh, that brings us to the concept of forgiveness because. Um, you, you know, to stay in that place where unforgiveness creates all of this stress and angst is not a very, um, it's not a very pleasant place to be. And so modern day psychology, as well as, uh, you know, our, our centuries old church and many faiths have thought about what forgiveness is. And, um, you know, recently I've seen some really good things. I don't know how many of you might be familiar with or part of Ascension Press. Um, I follow a lot of their work very closely. They um, are, are right in my kind of backyard, so to speak, in Duluth, Minnesota. And um, so uh, I've seen some really good online talks there recently about differences between divine forgiveness and uh, human forgiveness. And so we oftentimes think of human forgiveness as being this letting go of bad and replacing the bad with good. I, I typically say, especially when it comes to close relationships, you would hope that you could do more than just not hate your spouse again or your children again. You, you, you'd hope that you could do better than that. You would not hate them anymore and return to loving them, even though they may have hurt you at some point. And that's really the essence of how modern day psychology thinks about forgiveness is get rid of the bad, but not just not just get rid of the bad, replace it with probably the good that, that used to be there or preceded um, the bad. I'll reference a little bit as we go forgiveness of others and forgiveness of yourself. I'll also probably reference the fact that uh, sometimes we think of uh, forgiveness uh, in any form as kind of a virtue. We think of it as like a, a character trait. And other times we think of it as more of a kind of like a passing feeling um, you know, a state of being that, that kind of comes and goes. And then a, another common uh, way of thinking about forgiveness is that we oftentimes make a decision to do it, um, but that decision is kind of, you know, a head decision. Um, and it's really, you know, full forgiveness probably isn't really truly there until we have our heart involved. So you have kind of a emotional or a spiritual side, I like to think of. Um, Forgiveness from the heart is is kind of the the full um, embellishment of the uh, of the experience. 
So we've got our unforgiveness. We've got our, you know, kind of contrasting forgiveness and kind of the, what we think of as maybe the way out of, of injustice and, and kind of having maybe holding a grudge or having a hard time moving on. Um, and then we reach the real uh, question, and that is uh, most everyone, I think, is going to agree forgiveness is not easy. It, it, you know, there might be a few instances in which it seems like it is. I'm always a little distrusting of those. I just don't know why, but it, it just doesn't feel quite genuine to me. Um, I've seen, uh, you know, many, many times now uh, you see you watch the news or something and you see someone who a day after there's been a horrifying kind of act of violence or brutality people are standing up saying we forgive and i guess i don't i don't doubt that that's possible i just kind of they struggle to to feel like that's um as genuine and and uh as complete as it could be forgiveness usually takes time it usually takes a lot of want to it's kind of an ugly process sometimes you feel worse before you feel better um, and so I turn to a classic theory here that many of you might be familiar with, or maybe at some point in your training will become familiar with. It's called social learning theory. It was developed by Albert Bandura. Um, and just in brief, I mean, uh, there's lots more to say about this, but social learning theory says that there's three big pieces. You have to, you have to see examples. Um, in, in other words, you can't learn socially unless you have uh, someone in your social world to learn from. That's why I call it social learning theory. Um, it's, a, it's a social form of learning. So if I don't see other people that I can learn from, I'm in a lot of trouble. So you need models, whether they be in your family, your school, your you know, organizations or whatever. Number two, you need to believe you can do it. And I think that's a, that's a big hurdle for many. Uh, you know, just the sense of this is going to be really hard. The injustice was really great. Um, or maybe it's just ongoing. Um, and so the, the belief that you can do it has to be there. And then you have to have positive outcome expectancies. You have to believe that if you do it, good things are going to follow. And that's also sometimes a challenge that to hold on to those expectations that good things are going to follow um, is sometimes hard. Well, it turns out we have lots of models. Um, you can you know, you can probably uh, Google up on the web a, a number of different uh, examples, um, but certainly Nelson Mandela comes to mind, Desmond Tutu. There's other examples of people from various different cities, the Amish, um, you know, closer to your uh, neck of the woods in the, in the uh, you know, kind of vast geography of our country, kind of out in the Northeast. Um, you know, there's the story of the, uh, I think there's a, a, D, a DVD or a movie actually on Amish Grace, really incredible um, example of, of cultural or community forgiveness. So there's, you know, lots and lots and lots and lots of um, examples. So we have lots of models to learn from. Uh, we probably have to think about our own, you know, um, comfort level. Do I think I'm capable of forgiving either uh, someone else or myself? And, um, you know, oftentimes that's rated on kind of a zero to a hundred scale and uh, you know, the, the more confident you are, the more you're likely to do it. So we want to try to build that confidence. Well, oftentimes people can get kind of short circuited there and they, they can say, well, I, gee, I, I kind of feel like I could, but I just don't know how uh, I'd like to, but, you know, I see these examples and I, I'd really, I'd really like to follow these examples. Uh, you know, our Catholic faith provides the, you know, the, the best example of them all is Jesus Christ. I mean, that's it. That's that's the top of the heap. But I, you know, I'm just a, I'm just a regular guy. It's hard to imagine how I'm going to possibly get through this. And thankfully, that's where uh, the science and practice of psychology comes in. Um, you know, there's there's really good evidence based, well supported models that help people forgive. And the model that I'm showing in front of you starts with uh, the remembering part. And it works through empathy and feelings of altruism, commitment and holding on and overcoming. And, you know, 
with more time, we could go through each of those pieces, but uh, suffice to say that there are very well established methods for helping people forgive others. Some 50 plus now randomized controlled trials show that uh, these methods work and they, they work just the way you'd expect them to. The more people engage in them, the harder they work at it, the longer they spend on these things, the better they do, the more forgiving they become. Um, there are models that help people to forgive themselves. And uh, you can see here that in this case, the model here starts with the um, apologize uh, part and leads to, you know, trying to make amends, feeling forgiven, being forgiven, uh, leading into acceptance, um, a desire for self-improvement so that you, you know, hopefully don't make these same mistakes again in the future and hurt people. And then, you know, a lasting commitment to being a better person, forgiving yourself, moving forward, restoring your sense of values, restoring your self-esteem and so forth. So someone who's motivated, but says, I don't know, I don't know how to do this. There are, there are good options. Now the, the forgiveness of oneself option is far less tested. And I'm going to come back to that a little bit later. Um, but it has been, it, there's a limited amount of data suggesting that it is effective. It's good at helping people forgive themselves. So, um, you know, moving to the community level, you might say, well, communities have to sometimes forgive themselves because they've done things that they're not proud of. Um, sometimes communities are offended by other communities or societies, cultures, nations, whatever, entire groups. And so we think about how could these models that were originally developed, I mean, psychology is often kind of a, a science and practice focused on individuals and, and small groups. How could these things be extrapolated out to the larger community, to the larger social um, networks that we find ourselves in. Well, uh, we've done a little bit of that work. And what we find is that uh, building forgiving communities means that you have some of the same things um, present in the community level that you have in the, in, in the individual case. So even though I didn't really um, talk about it, People oftentimes confuse uh, forgiveness and justice, thinking that there are two opposite ends of the same spectrum. And that's not really true. Justice is an independent thing. You can all probably think of um, times in which you have gotten no justice, but been able to forgive and move on. And you can probably also think about times where you got complete perfect justice, but just could never quite forgive. And that, that suggests that they're really two independent processes, but one can can help the other. And oftentimes, um, environments where justice is, is done, um, people feel safe and valued. Uh, these are conducive environments for forgiving. Uh, communities where you have uh, models and leaders present, kind of leading, leading the charge, so to speak, um, keeping it in the forefront of people's minds, um, opportunities and support for forgiveness, you might think of uh, some of the national efforts, the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions um, have been kind of good examples of um, it not always not always perfect implementation, but but um, you know uh, good purpose, good intent to provide opportunities. Uh, when we think about process, uh, again, we you know we probably refer back to some of those models that we've tested in individuals and think about the extent to which we can move community, communities through a similar process. And then, um, you know, policy level changes, things that might uh, help to make forgiveness more of a kind of a natural and, and easier first option instead of kind of a last resort. Um, and then the last thing that I'll, I'll come back to and just reference is the notion of exposure and promotion. Uh, forgiveness. Like anything, if you want to kind of sell a group or a community on an idea, you're going to have to work at it. And so um, we'll, we'll come back and revisit that in a minute. Um, I do want to say that, you know, there's lots of community psychology that's been done, lots that has been learned. Um, and I provide a quote here about community systems change, which is, is probably the level of 
change that we're thinking about when we think about, um, you know, large scale uh, forgiveness issues. Um, and so I'll just read the quote here. It's an intentional process designed to alter the status quo. What I was kind of referencing earlier about kind of moving away from a revenge mentality or a retributive justice model by shifting and realigning the form and function of a targeted system. So um, lots of levers of change involved in that, right? There's change in norms, system resources, systems regulations, policies and procedures that I mentioned earlier, and then operations, you know, people in power, people that are decision makers have to support this and be, um, you know, be leaders in this regard. Um, so those are some things to think about in terms of like, uh, you know, what is forgiveness? Why would people want to do it? How would they be motivated to do it? What are the kind of models of, of processing um, forgiveness and how might we uh, expand that into the community? Um, but that's really all on the forgiveness side. Um, I wanted in the last few minutes to share a few things about the flourishing side. Flourishing is for some folks defined as uh, good mental and physical health and happiness, all of those things combined together. For others, they include things like um, satisfactory uh, vocational pursuits, um, sufficient income and education and sufficient uh, monetary resources. And um, so flourishing in kind of a, even a broader sense uh, that also kind of enters into the that equation of um, the community again. So um, I just wanted to share a few things to keep you thinking about this. Um, what sorts of opportunities to flourish are there through forgiveness? And we've spent a good deal of time over the last couple of decades trying to examine this question. And you can see titles here that kind of lead you to the conclusions about uh, forgiveness and longevity and forgiveness and stress and and health and forgiveness in the workplace and health and productivity. And so I'm just gonna highlight a few things that we found um, and then uh, share with you just a little bit about what we wanna do, which I'm kind of excited about. Um, and so in terms of flourishing, you know, I kind of said it, it can be a large umbrella and uh, we have about a hundred DC office workers here that were surveyed and we found out that forgiveness is related to these office workers' mental health, physical health, to their absenteeism, lesser absenteeism, and to greater productivity. And so um, we tried to look at something similar in some Midwest manufacturing employees, and we found a very similar thing, that um, forgiveness was related to mental and physical health and to reduced work stress and greater productivity. And ultimately, we found um, that if we put this all together in kind of a complicated statistical model that you know we don't have a lot of time to get into here, but we found out that people that were more forgiving in their nature, this is trait forgiveness, not just a fleeting state, but they had fewer negative occupational outcomes. And that was in large part because the more forgiving people had fewer workplace stressors, um, the conflicts that they got into, the arguments, the upsets at work, they seem to just be able to put them away and move on and get past them in a, in a more uh, quick and timely fashion. And that led to, you know, better outcomes. Uh, in other work, we've, uh, we've attempted to understand how forgiveness might kind of interact, you might say, with stress and health and work problems. And we found that uh, people who are low in forgiveness even medium in forgiveness, they have a pretty noticeable correlation between stress and these important outcomes. But people who have high levels of forgiveness, it turns out that the forgiveness just kind of erases the connection between stress and health and work problems that, that is typically very, very strong and robust. I mean, in almost every sample you ever look at, you find these um, very consistent relationships between stress and health and work. And, um, you know, when we looked exclusively at just people who are, are high forgivers, that connection is just not there. It, it's just absent. It's, there's no statistically uh, significant relationship between stress and health and work problems for people that are high forgivers, which is um, it's amazing, right? That's, a, that's an incredible protective benefit 
of forgiveness. And so just again, as a sample of some other things that we've looked at, uh, this was a sample of um, a variety of people involved in the financial services sector. So these are financial services advisors, vice presidents, administrative assistants, about 100 of them completed a one day forgiveness training and some follow up coaching over the course of the next couple of months. And as we expected, they, they showed all kinds of good um, uh, changes in stress and health and wellness. And the thing that uh, just about knocked me off my chair when I saw it is that they also showed a 20% increase in sales productivity as a result of learning how to be more forgiving. Um, and all I can come back to in that context is to say, yeah, you know, forgiveness is kind of an unproductive thing, isn't it? You spend a lot of time thinking about the past. And sometimes you spend a lot of time thinking about pretty destructive things about how to get back at people. Um, and especially in the workplace, that's gonna interfere with productivity. It soaks up a lot of your energy and it soaks up a lot of your time to collaborate with others. And you know, it, it shows in the ultimate bottom line that um, forgiveness, the paper we published here, I don't know if you can see the title, but we titled it a little tongue in cheek. We said, is forgiveness one of the secrets to success, right? You'd probably never, You'd never think of that or, you know, talk about that. Well, regrettably, I had my own uh, experience with forgiveness in the workplace. And uh, it takes me back a few years now. And I'm happy to say I'm well past that. But as, uh, uh, as the vice chair of the uh, Scientific Advisory Council for the Templeton um, World Charity Foundation, I was asked to write a blog about forgiveness, health, and happiness that described a little bit of the new resource that we developed that's called Discover Forgiveness. And I'm really excited about it. We spent a lot of time and uh, put in a, a lot of effort in getting um, you know, a, a really nice collection of resources available. So if you wanna learn about forgiveness and ways to you know, help people become more forgiving, there's stuff for you on that website, Discover um, forgiveness. And if you just want to know more about the health consequences, there's stuff on that website for you. And so I wrote this blog, but, um, you know, the thing that I wrote about was what we were just talking about. And that is um, being hurt in the workplace is really a difficult thing um, to get past. And, um, you know, one of my first reactions when I had that experience was that I was just going to quit. I just felt like quitting and wanted to, uh, you know, do whatever I could to, you know, make the other people involved hurt. And so I wanted to quit on a day's notice, right? I wasn't going to give two weeks notice. I wasn't going to, you know, do something, you know, respectful and, and professional. I just wanted out and I wanted people to suffer the consequences. And um, that was a really, really tough thing to work through. And it turns out it happened at a time that I wasn't quite as, you know, acquainted with um, the forgiveness literature as I am now. So, um, you know, the, the blog is there if you want to go and read more about it. Um, I'm going to bring us back in the last couple minutes here to a couple of things that I've uh, alluded to um, earlier. Uh, and that is uh, one aspect of community forgiveness building is the notion of promotion. And um, a few years back, we did a, for, a community forgiveness campaign which we called the Community Forgiveness Blitz. And we did it at Luther College and um, it's been done, a similar kind of model has been done now a few times um, around the globe. And it really consists of um, essentially just inundating people. You, you know, you watching Netflix these days, sometimes you feel like you're being inundated with commercials for whatever you searched on the web for last, right? Um, all the data sharing that's going on and so I can't get through a, a Netflix episode without seeing, you know, more ads for, uh, you know, a new lawnmower. It's like I, I was interested in that for five minutes and now I, I can't get away from it. That's the level of um, inundation that we tried to provide in our community. We put forgiveness everywhere. We put it on the radio and the student newspaper. The chapels that week were focused on forgiveness um, we had some lectures, we had poetry competitions, we had some musical performance all focused around forgiveness. 
And so we really just tried to saturate the community to the point where we were just dripping in forgiveness. And then we measured a variety of different things, um, relationships with teachers and relationships with staff and relationships with roommates and conflict and feelings of love and welcomingness. And sure enough, just the exposure is enough to kind of trigger that and keep it kind of fresh in people's minds that we, we for, a, for a moment, we built a more forgiving community. And uh, it showed people reported that they were more forgiving, they were more loving, they were more caring of the people that they were around. And so, um, as I said, the self-forgiveness literature has been a little behind here, and the efficacy of um, those methods are a little less unclear. So we're going to Trinidad and Tobago. It's the southernmost island in the Caribbean. It's just, you can see, I've highlighted it there. Um, it's just barely north of South America. Um, and we're going to be working in that community to develop a community self-forgiveness intervention aimed at reducing the exceedingly high rates of suicide risk in the Caribbean, the struggles that they have with addictions um, and the, uh, the, the constant struggles with self-forgiveness resulting from that. And then, of course, the mental health consequences of that are um, going to be uh, key to, to our understanding here as well. Um, we just found out that, that uh, the Templeton World Charity Foundation funded this study for us. So we are literally just now on the cusp of getting some things rolling and figuring out how to do this work. Um, it's going to be a big challenge, but um, we have uh, we have some good funding and good resources and um, and really outstanding colleagues. So um, I'm look, really looking forward to it and I'm hopeful that we can really do um, some good work here to foster community level forgiveness and also um, bolster what we know about uh, effective uh, self-forgiveness campaigns. So I'll leave you with a couple things here. Um, one is that a few years ago now, I can't believe it's that long ago, but we tried to collect the research on forgiveness and health. And uh, we put that into this book, Forgiveness and Health, and uh, tried to develop a kind of a model or a way of thinking about how forgiveness and, and health and flourishing all go together. And uh, my kind of integrative nature, um, again, is thinking about forgiveness and kind of spirituality being a centerpiece of our physical, mental, and social well-being. Uh, and then finally, I'll leave you with, uh, I started with what I imagined or what I'm hopeful that it might look like in uh, D.C. And so if you get down, I, I'm sure all of you, um, you know, from wherever, part, whatever parts of the world you might be coming from, um, if you ever get down there, um, maybe you'll see that. Maybe if at some point somebody comes to visit me, this is what you'll see. Um, these are just some images of my uh, community here in uh, Northeast Iowa. Uh, as well as my contact information and, um, you know, email, phone number stuff. So, um, so uh, yeah, that kind of brings us full circle. Thank you so much. Really, really appreciate your input and your thoughts. Really, really, really exciting research um, you're going to move forward into. I would love to hear an update there. Um, Marie, uh, just a chat, if you all have questions, um or input or want to probe further um just put it in the chat room or in the q a so one of the comments um was for your study that you're just now starting in trinidad please examine the root cause of the suicides as so many suicides are now actually homicides disguised as suicides and then just a thank you for the presentation any comment or thoughts you want to add to that yeah absolutely thank you that's uh, that's super. Um, uh, the notion of suicide in the Caribbean is really, uh, uh, you know, it's a it's a deep rooted problem. Um, I don't think we will in, entirely, you know, be able to uh, address it just through self forgiveness. But yeah, that's a great point, and and we will definitely um, take that under advisement because uh, that's important to be able to you know separate those things so 
Yeah, and there was a contact person for somebody for psychology in Trinidad, if you're oh, interested. Yes, absolutely I am. You better believe I am interested. Yes, Perfect. thank so you. So maybe um, if they, they can connect or email you later um, or email me and I'll forward. I would um, love that, yes. Thank that would, you. But, um, yeah. Penelope, if you want to um, email that contact information to me, I'll forward it. So then yeah. one question that came up was, how does one know if they have fully forgiven? Ah, yeah, that's a great one. Um, how do you know if you've fully forgiven is it's actually a fairly common question. And I'm going to borrow from my um, you know, my mentors and role models here in responding to that. Um, some would say uh, when you no longer want, uh, want um, hurt or pain for that person, you no longer have ill will, and you, um, you know, you can kind of wish the person well, if we're talking about forgiveness of others. That's maybe one, you know, uh, marker that you've probably reached complete forgiveness in some way. But I like the explanation um, that I've heard from other folks better. And, and it's it goes something like this. Um, it, it says, um, the answer to how do you know if you have fully forgiven is similar to the answer to how do you know if you're in love? And uh, turns out the the answer isn't really that clear. You know, you, that, that's a, probably an impossible question to answer. But you just know it. You you know uh, the genuine experience, the genuine feelings that you have, and the genuine thoughts that you have toward a person. And um, it's one of those things that we just kind of recognize when we see it. And I wish I had a better answer for that. The, the more kind of objective scientific approach is to say, well, it's the absence of ill will and the presence of wishing someone well, that can be measured. But I don't believe that when we're talking about things of the spirit, which forgiveness is, is first and foremost, I don't believe that we have all the answers and that science is gonna be able to necessarily provide that for us. Best we can do is get kind of a rudimentary sense of things. And um, so, uh, you know, you continue to listen to the um, the groanings and the rumblings of the Holy Spirit, and you make your uh, sense of how genuinely complete your forgiveness process is based in that 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 kind of equation is one that I can't put numbers to, but. So somebody made a comment, so wondering what your thoughts on this. Gary mentioned when you don't feel like a victim anymore. Would you say that's one indicator of having fully forgiven? Yeah, I mean, one of the things we talk about a lot in forgiveness is the victim story. It doesn't help um, when you're uh, when, when you're uh, wrapped up in telling people about how poorly you've been treated. You're really uh, you know, kind of looking inward, you're, some people would say you're too much inside your own head. Um, and so certainly when you can start to change the, the way that you talk about it, um, and, and that change moves you from saying, uh, when somebody asks, how are you doing, instead of saying, well, let me tell you what happened to me. Um, and you go on then for, you know, hours about how you've been so terribly treated. And you can start to move to a place where you might say, well, you know, I've had some bad things happen in life, but I've, I've somehow managed to get past them. And uh, you start to take on what we call the, the story of a hero instead of the story of a victim. Yeah, that's probably a sign you're turning a corner. Very, very good. Then another question Lucia asked, uh, would you please review the model of forgiving others again that you presented earlier? And sure. then my question is, do you have a re the website you mentioned is a resource, correct? Um, yep. If somebody wants to follow up, read more, maybe take it to their parish youth ministry, where would, where's good resources they could use? Like for a hands-on, these are the steps helping people walk through this. 
I just put that in the chat. It's it's discoverforgiveness.org um, that I was referencing earlier. Um, there's lots of resources. Uh, we have a bunch of resources on our Forgiveness Foundation page. That would be um, forgivenessfoundationinternational.org. Um, and, uh, you know, just all kinds of, you know, uh, if you went to luther.edu and put in the first part of my email, T-O-U-S-L-O-0-1, you'll find some more things. If you look at my colleagues' webpage, um, fworthington.com, I think, fworthington.something, um, you know, Google, Google F. Worthington and forgiveness and you'll get it. If you look at my other colleague, uh, Fred Luskin's page, the Stanford Forgiveness Project, um, you will find resources there. There's no shortage of places to find um, resources on forgiveness. The ones that I'm mentioning here are ones that I trust, that I, I feel are good resources um, to help people uh, with their struggles. Y you will also find lots and lots of kind of pop culture around forgiveness. It's a topic that lots of people like to kind of um, pontificate on, uh, but it's sometimes hard to tell what's, um, you know, what's good work that has been well supported, that is effective, and what is just people's kind of opinions about, you know, how to think about forgiveness. So someone was asking about the process of forgiving others. So let me back up, because um, that's, I'm, I'm delighted that you asked about that. Um, and I'm going to figure out, uh, there we go. Um, I'm going to back up to that. Uh, it starts with remembering. So this, I don't know if you can see my mouse move, but um, it starts with remembering and then leads into empathy. So the, the key thing that we think about uh, when we talk about forgiveness is, um, you know, we, we want to... Um, we want to know what it is that we are trying to forgive. And so um, it's, it's, it's really important that we start there. Um, remembering is, um, it's just key. If you don't know what you're trying to accomplish, there's, there's just not much success to be had. Um, I, I put it this way. I put it, you know, an analogy would be to say, I want to be a better person. You know, that's great. But uh, what specifically do you want to do? And the same thing is true in, in the case of, um, of forgiveness, that you might want to be a more forgiving person, but you got to start with something. And so remember, you know, whatever hurtful thing it is that that you want to kind of try to work on and start with that and move forward with that. Um, that leads to empathizing. And empathy is, you might say, um, you know, as a kid, I loved the teeter-totter. The fulcrum is the middle point that everything kind of shifts around. Uh, and the fulcrum for forgiveness might be empathy. If you can't find a way to, to find some way to see the other person's side of this, it, it might be a real short road for forgiveness. Um, some people can't. They just can't empathize. Uh, in my case that I write about in, in my blog, um, you know, I had, I had to kind of think a little bit about my boss at the time, what they were thinking about when they offended me. And after I thought a little bit about that, it just kind of, it eased a little bit of the pain. I, I was able to say, oh, yeah, maybe there is a way I can forgive this person. They're, they're not evil to the core the way I thought they were. If you can't empathize, at least try to sympathize. Can you feel sorry for the person? Is there, you know, is there some way that you can kind of recontextualize this a little bit? Um, and, uh, and then you move on to the idea of altruism. And that is to say that we've all needed to be forgiven at some point. And if you're unwilling to forgive, then uh, if you know your scripture at all, you know that that's a bad place to be because if you're unwilling to forgive, then you are granted nothing in return. And 
So the idea that you have been given an unearned, that's altruism, it's unearned. You're, you're helping and you're giving um, and no one deserves it. Um, and that's the same gift that you've been given. And if you're unwilling to give it back, um, that's really a tough spot to be. And usually that's a pretty powerful motivator um, for people to, to realize, okay, so I'm convinced then I'm not going to forgive this person. And, you know, my response is then, okay, so you're ready to never be forgiven yourself then. And if that's the, those are the options that you're up against, you maybe feel like there's some way you could find a way to forgive this person. Um, the notion of commitment follows and commitment is all about um, the fact that sometimes changes are easy to make or they're easier than you might think, but they're harder to maintain. And that's a really difficult part of any process of change is that you don't, you, you not only have to make the change, you have to maintain it. You have to commit to it. And then holding on represents the notion that uh, you will be challenged. And when you are, you need to overcome those challenges, recognizing that it's not a sign of weakness or failure, that you might have feelings of revenge bubbling back up in you the first time that you encounter the person in person again and you really want to lash out at them, that doesn't mean that you're a terrible, unforgiving person. It means that you're normal and that uh, in a weak moment, some of these things really kind of overcame you. But um, finding a way to calm yourself, to you know, reorient your commitment, um, reorient yourself to your commitment to forgive, think about the empathy, you know, try to see their perspective in the equation, think about being an altruistic person. All of those things have to come back to bear on those times in which you're going to be challenged and that you need to overcome those, um, those hurdles. So I forget, I was trying to follow the chat a little bit here. I don't know who asked that question, but I hope that's uh, sufficient. There are many, many exercises built into each one of these steps. Um, this is Everett Worthington's model. It's called the reach model and uh, everworthington.com or org or something. Um, has has those um, uh, he has a workbook available there um, that you could go and and use um, if you wanted to go in even greater depth into those steps. Yeah, thank uh, you very much. Very helpful. Really, so mm -hmm. much to unpack. Right, so so oh. much to go. Yeah. Further and deeper. So, so going back to the um, one one final question before we close. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat. So. Um, if you think in community and forgiveness, right? I'm curious when some of the community is willing to forgive, some not, or how do you, what's your research or your experience with, right? Community, um, wanting to forgive, not wanting to forgive, right? That um, working with those different, the big range, right? Probably of attitudes and willingness to move forward. Yeah. Um that's the hard part of it. Uh, when we were doing our uh, our community forgiveness work here uh, on the campus, uh, you know, like I said, we we had we had just blitzed the campus community with forgiveness. And in the midst of that, uh, you know, we had a bunch of articles going into the student newspaper. Um, back when student newspapers were printed on on an actual rag, you know, it was kind of fun. I was picking it up and reading each day like, oh, that's a good one. Um, and then I picked it up one day and I read an article that was, um, you know, pretty, uh, I wouldn't say insulting, but it was just, it was kind of negative toward forgiveness. And they were, you know, kind of saying this is uh, I kind of wish you guys would stop doing this. Uh, at best, you're making everyone who's not real forgiving or real excited about forgiving feel bad. Um, so there is that aspect of, at the community level, um, creating consensus and building consensus. And um, while I'd like to believe I'm taking on more of that role as I get a little older and a little further into my career, um, you know, it's still one of those things that we all have to kind of grow into. Um, and, and sometimes people who are younger are really good at it right away. But 
community building, uh, consensus raising, um, you know, developing kind of a following, creating a cohesiveness to the way that a group thinks. These are characteristics of leadership, right? Good leaders do these things. They bring people together. They unite them around common causes. They lead them in positive directions. Um, we need leaders who are ultimately in some of the things that I've just talked about, they're models, they're role models of forgiveness. We need leaders that embrace forgiveness as a core requirement of the communities that they lead. And that's, um, that's the best answer I can give in, in terms of uh, there are probably no uh, secret remedies for building consensus in groups. Uh, we know there are things that help and things that hurt to build cohesiveness in groups from social psychology. But, um, you know, when, when good leaders can, can create a kind of overarching goal that, that kind of brings everyone together, focused around a single mission, um, incredible things can happen. Right. When we when we leave our differences aside and say we need to we need to let these lesser things be something that takes up less of our time and we need to focus on the big stuff and get that right. Um, that's where you can really see incredible change take place. Um, you know, that's my hope. That's my hope and prayer for mm -hmm. all communities that are struggling with conflict and violence and injustice and. So, so there's one last question that popped in the chat is yeah. you mentioned that forgiveness is a trait. Is there a forgiveness assessment scale that may help to determine where my, one might fall on the scale? Yeah, absolutely. There are actually several of them. Um, the trait forgiveness scale comes to mind very quickly. Uh, that's been around for probably 15 years, been used widely. Uh, there might not be uh, uh, in terms of norms, if you want to compare yourself to where you stand, uh, the norms might be a little hard for you to find. Um, there is a tool called the Enright Forgiveness Inventory. That's a, a long-standing tool as well. Um, the EFI for short, Enright. Uh, Bob Enright is a few hours from me at the University of Wisconsin um, and developed that scale also probably some 20 years ago. So it's been used uh, for a long time. Um, I'm thinking of the, uh, what is known, it's a really long name, but the, it's the transgression related, uh, uh, transgression related inventory uh, of um, motivations, uh, something to that um, effect. It's short is the trim. Um, that's another uh, good scale. There are several others that, you know, are, are probably the, the names of them aren't relevant here. Um, but certainly if someone wanted, um, you know, uh, just to, uh, either for just kind of fun or for personal insight or self-help, um, if you wanted any of those kinds of scales, I can certainly send them and send, um, and send some e easy reference points. I use those often in classes and I, I have the reference points. You know, this is what the average is in a group of college students. This is what the average is in adults, you know. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Uh, anyone interested in that? Um, please, uh, you know, either let Dr. Klausi know or myself and, and uh, I'm, I'd be happy to share that. Wonderful. Th thank you so much. Um, what a helpful glimpse, right? First glimpse. <laughs> and I think um, giving an appetite for more and just even listening to you, right? I'm thinking so many areas of um, application, right? It's just um, yeah. incredible and need to teach people that it's possible um, and introduce the concepts. And uh, so thank you very much. This was uh, wonderful. Really, really appreciate your input. And thank you very much for coming. Everybody who's been able to come will um, send the recording out. I know we have um, so many people in all time zones of this world in our program. So <clears throat> for those who are um, on the Asian side, I guess they're probably asleep, or Australia and um, Africa, probably also. <laughs> so 
anyway, but um, we'll send out the recording. And thank you again so much, Dr. Toussaint. It was really wonderful. Really, yes. really appreciate. And uh, good night to everybody. Thank you for coming. And so good to have everybody. Thank and you. And our next IPS Global Talk will be starting again in the fall. We do two in the fall, two in the spring. So stay posted for announcements for the fall talks. But thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It was my honor, my privilege. Thank you so much. Enjoyed it greatly.